Okay. <clears throat> 20 questions for confusing sonic deception, reception, reception, re re reception. Uh, first of all, thank you to the occultured organizers for the conference and for the opportunity to be here and share my research with all of you. And um, although I'm, I'm late to the attuned bang of bandwagon, I'm, I'm happy to be able to attend my first hearing speculation here. Uh, so the subject of my, my talk and my PhD um, is how we can listen like objects, or, or rather what it means to experience sound like an object, or rather uh, what it is for objects to transduce, transduce sonic vibrations. So um, what is it like for machines to experience music, and, and what do whales think of submarines? Um, if, as it has been proposed, that non-human objects have experiences, how can we explore the nature of these experiences without falling back into anthropocent anthropocentrisms? How can a critical engagement with sound art and recent sonic technologies provide us with an alternate route to the roots of what is what it is like to experience sound as a non-human object. So today I'd like to put my ear to the ground and try to get a closer to what happens when we attempt to anthropo-decentralize sound. I, I don't plan to arrive at any concrete results as I'm still trying to congeal what the central question is that I'm, I'm faced with. But um, Rather, I'd like to look to just raise some questions about the problems relating to the sonoontological turn which so many of us are invested in. Um, we may try to better understand non-humans through biology, acoustics, sound art, triple O, and creative research, but eventually these tactics <coughs> seem to sort of turn back on themselves in a Borisian fashion, humanly rationalizing that which may have no rational rationale. Um, speculating about the sonic experiences of things, we end up applying the very violence we seek to discombobulate. So where does that leave us? How do we probe the minds, materials, and assemblages of objects without your own human essence oozing in, in the process? Um, it's important for me to point out just a few caveats, I guess, about my approach. I don't want to argue for some sort of pantheist animation in the sense of giving soul to objects. It's essentially this uh, chasm I'm trying to avoid. Yet, I feel that I keep going in circles around it in these dizzying ways that we saw yesterday. Um, consciousness is not a common aspect of objects in the world, and even when thinking about feelings, which are just as often non-conscious. Stephen Shaviro confronts this issue concisely in the introduction to his book, Discognition. And I'm quoting, plants are indeed sentient as recent research has convincingly shown, but this does not necessarily mean that they're conscious. Plants feel, in Whitehead's sense, they encounter the world, but they do not, but they do, not do so in a manner which we are acquainted, end quote. And as Le Levy Bryant says in The Democracy of Objects, while rocks, for example, are certainly open to sound waves, they are not, as far as I know, open to signifiers. Although this seems to give us some grounding, we're now faced with the problem of whether consciousness is necessary for experience, and whether signifiers even have anything to do with my question. Um, yeah, and, and nor am I trying to say that artists that are working with sound have some sort of special rarefied access to the inner life of objects. However, art and other creative approaches might give us a better sense of what it is to be an object than accounting does, or genetics, or maybe even conference paper presentations. <laughs> um, so, this may be a, a different fragment. Human, human hearing is defined at, at 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, the 19 and the, the 21 always like escaping us, but, but sound affects more than our ears and different objects at different frequencies. So my initial spark uh, started around this commonly held belief regarding the spectrum of human hearing um, to be this very defined space, but with bats and dolphins listening at um, higher frequency ranges than us, and elephants, some say, in lower, then we must expand this 2020k scope. But where do we stop? What do insects do to the size of the spectrum? Um, and should we also include plants? And then it becomes even a bit larger, and if we include plants, we surely should 
include machines of various orders, and then what about stones? And then you see my problem. So the limits of sound change depending on the nature of the object, but whether we talk about humans, parrots, non-organic entities, or even mountains. But it's not just about frequency ranges, because bats, ferns, cars, and elephants don't just listen within a different frequency range than humans. They even experience sounds differently through their various bodies. So both Steve Goodman and Douglas Kahn show us that, that objects aren't just receivers or listeners, but they're also transducers of vibration implicated in the co-production of sound. So this means that they, via their bodies, they being objects, uh, are co-creators of their own sonic experience in a continuous interplay between receiving and creating. So if sound um, is dispersed as vibrations that come in contact with all matter of objects, then any object must be a transducer. So if a tree or a building sways under the vibrations of an earthquake or a nearby motorway, they themselves swing, can we begin to think of these objects as experiencing sound, at the very least, their sonic transducers in their, of their, in their own right? So the limits of uh, human sonic experience are not defined by precise points, but by these like fuzzy borders on a sliding scale. But then other frequencies on the electromagnetic scale encompass light, radio, x-rays, and microwaves. So sound art and sonic technologies illuminate these borders and call into question the nature of sonic experience. Where do we draw the line as to what we consider sound? Where exactly does electromagnetic vibration go from being a radar signal to being a sound wave to being a radio wave? Experiments, and this is a, another fragment, maybe number two, I guess. Experiments by computer scientists and engineers at MIT have shown that various objects can decode voices and other minute sonic vibrations through the help of high-speed video cameras. The video cameras uh, record the visual vibrations that sound leaves on objects, and through their software, this visual information is once again tr translated it back into sound. So this makes it possible to transform everyday objects, a glass of water, a plant, a bag of chips, into listening devices. Uh, at MIT, they, they call these devices visual microphones, transducers between sound and light. Um, so the sounds pick up, picked up by these visual microphones have literally come from light, transformed from one, of one form of energy to another. And sound artist uh, Lawrence Abu Hamdan explored the consequence of this in his work, Convention of Tiny Movements from 2015, which was accompanied by a strange sonography of amalgamated objects, including microphone stands and pop shields, incorporated with tissue boxes, plants, and the inner foil wrapper of a lint chocolate bar. The second part of the project was an exhibition of uh, 5,000 chips bags distributed throughout the art fair as a sort of paranoia-inducing evidence of the possibility of visual microphones. So the objects recorded um, by the visual microphones don't give a sort of crystal clear sonic reproductions of what they receive. There's also always a lot of excess noise in there that's stored on the surface of these objects. So the researchers at MIT um, dubbed the sounds as the object's sonic color. But can we see this excess sound as an evidence of the object's individual voice? If objects listen and have, have vo voices, might this be a step in the direction of an expanded understanding of experience and sound? What are you hearing when you hear a water organ? You're hearing the water modulating through the pipes and the concrete body, concrete body of the organ, concrete, concrete. You're hearing two objects as they relate to one another. The water organ can only sound after the water has interacted with it, and vice versa. And after you've heard the pressure waves created by the vibration translated by a transducer in your inner ear that turn pressure waves into electrochemical signals. Sounds are entities in their own right, coexisting in an ecology of sonic hosts and parasites. Entities are somewhere between agency and affect. If mind is not that which is inside an organic, mechanical, or digital system, but in the vein of um, some speculative realisms, something that is between objects, distributed and interobjected, then behavior, physiology, and sensory motor affordances might not be the best place to start probing the experience of objects. But then how do we probe the interobjective? Karen Barad claims that 
quote, all life forms, including inanimate forms of liveliness, do theory, meaning, end quote, meaning that all objects figure and reconfigure themselves by experimenting with the world. So from this object-based theory making, interspecies collaborative research can take flight. Farad proposes to do this through touch, and what's more tactile, more haptic than sonic vibrations? Uh, and this sense of vibrational ontology has been taken up by Steve Goodman and, and similarly, but, but in a different language by the theory of sonic affects by Will Scrimshaw, a tuner himself, I hear. <laughs> <coughs> Skip that one. So this is the cover of an 1882 book containing the official rules for the game 20 Questions. <laughs> <laughs> to come closer to this uh, reality of non-human sonic experience, I suggest a game of Willerian tw negative 20 questions. My interest was recently piqued by Mark Gruot's um, We Are Legion where he briefly mentioned John Archibald Wheeler's doctored, question, doctored version of the 20 questions game, negative 20 questions. Wheeler was a theoretical physicist studying under Niels Bohr and working with him on the general principle, principles of nuclear fission. Uh, Wheeler worked with the Manhattan Project's methodological laboratory in Chicago, or the Met Lab, as they call it. <laughs> this is where the world's first nuclear um, reactor was built, but they soon described it, decided that a more remote location, location might be a fitting uh, for this part of the Met Labs operations. Um, Wheeler not only helped develop nuclear reactors and the hydrogen, hydrogen bomb, but he also developed poetic concepts such as quantum foam, wormhole, and it from bit. Um, Wheeler describes this, this, and this is more pages from the book, Wheeler describes this, um, this game of negative questions as follows, and I apologize for this lengthy quote, but I have time for it, and I feel that it sort of gives a good sense of it. And right now, I wish I had uh, Lady Baronia Jackson's elocution, because <laughs> it will really add to the experience, I think. Less than a cheat. <laughs> <laughs> you recall how it goes. One of the after-dinner party members are sent out the living room, the others agreeing on a word, the one fated to be the questioner returning and starting his questions. So the questions go from respondent to respondent around the room until at length the word emerges, victory if in 20 tries or left, otherwise defeat. Then comes a moment when we are forth to be sent from the room. We are locked out unbelievably long. On finally being readmitted, we find a smile on everyone's face, a sign of a joke or a plot. We innocently start our questions. At first, the answers come quickly. Then each question begins to take longer in answering, strange when the answer itself is just a simple yes or no. At length, feeling hot on the trail, we ask, is the word cloud? Yes, comes the reply, and everybody bursts out laughing. <laughs> when we were out of the room, they explained, they had agreed not to agree in advance on any word at all. <laughs> each one around the circle could respond yes or no as he pleased to whatever question we put to him. But however he replied, he had to have a word in mind compatible with his own reply and with all the replies that went before. No wonder some of these decisions between yes and no proved so hard. That's Wheeler. Um, so, so questions are asked to the object in order to get the core of the object's reality. Yet with every question, the object morphs and adapts, into the subject's adapts to the subject's expectations, refusing to become a coherent entity. As Caro says in We Are Legion, reality is defined by the questions we put to it. So it's a, it's, uh, it's a, necessar it's a necessarily human nature of, of science. In Isabella Stenger's uh, first book of Cosmopolitics, she describes the consequences of Wheeler's thinking if we're not careful to purge ourselves from the world. Using quantum mechanics, Wheeler's, Wheeler claims that the universe itself, like everything that exists in space-time, owes its actual existence to the observer or subject. So therefore, if we follow an anthropic view of the world, the claim is that science is leading us towards an unsettling conclusion, that the endpoint of the universe is the production of those who describe it. 
<laughs> After reading Gru's uh, We Are Legion and serendipitously finding myself in Chicago, I decided to we visit Wheeler's old office at the Metallurgical <coughs> Laboratory. This is what it looked like, used to look like. This is it now. <laughs> <laughs> they put up the drywall, I guess. Uh, I, met, I met with a grad student there named Raymond. During his, <laughs> during his PhD in chemistry there. And you wouldn't believe it, but he told me that this copy room was allegedly installed by Lucy Suchman in the late 80s. I don't know, maybe, yeah. <laughs> in the department's records, I discovered uh, documents that show a different side of this negative 20 questions game. More than a sort of damning description of science inevitable anthropocentrism, Wheeler actually attempted to move beyond his own observations and solve this very problem the game represented. In his later years, Wheeler's research showed months and months of work in the 19, or not, yeah, in his later years there, in the 50s, um, <laughs> in which he wrote out hundreds of imaginary games of negative, quest, negative 20 questions in order to come closer to the reality or experience of objects. So they're completely, they were like archived without any plan or system and, and making sense of it was quite laborious. Um, some sets methodolo methodologically asked sort of a row of 20 standardized questions of everything from parrots to calculators and dust, just sort of trying to level everything. Whereas other sets pose more sort of gibberish questions which seeming, with seemingly no interest of arriving at any sort of lucid result. Um, I'll show you some of the key examples I found already. Transcribed. Um, so this first one is very sort of simple. And some of the best ones I think are: Are you real or imaginary? Are you in this room right now? Can I eat you? <laughs> Do you smell better than a skunk? And this is just one of the many similar sets of this. Like this is one of like, and then you do them again and again and again. And it's interesting to see in these early examples, these earlier sets that his use of you to address the objects, and, and the very naive approach he takes in these sets. Completely unassuming even regarding the object's physical makeup, as if he couldn't see it with his own eyes. Um, this is another one. Um, he even asks, like, how is the object oriented? <laughs> is, this like a, is this like a chronoportation of concepts we've got going on? But also, like, does the object fit into a known genre? Does the object interact, how does the object interact with human bodies? It's this, uh, what's your emotional response? It, it's far more, like, formal in nature and also asking questions that seem to suit, like, an art object almost. So maybe he was actually, actually trying to figure out what it was to be an artwork. Um, and there were a few uh, notebooks there describing his methodology behind these questions. Um, so how do you ask a printer what it is to be a printer? He has a long thing about that, printed on dot matrix uh, stock, so that's fitting. Um, so do you speak to it like you would a human? Do you touch it and caress it? Do you probe the printer's phenomenal world and print questions through it? <laughs> or do you print something that has so much information that it engages all of the mechanical parts of the printer? Yeah. Or do you plug it into various socket, sockets and observe the response? Or do you take it apart and put it back together? With, like, how do you get at this? That's some of the questions he posed. And like, we haven't even started to ask about, this is some of my thoughts, like he hasn't even started to think about the sonic aspects of this experience. And are the printer's sounds the, that they make, are they communicative? or? What is it that it would communicate? Is, there sound, is the sounds opera operative in nature? Does it have a sense of aesthetics? And here's another set that I, oh, it's, yeah, well, I, I quite like. Um, has these like, what can I call you? What's new? Do you think I should alter my programming? Which is a funny reversal there. Uh, what is it like to be you? By we, do you mean you and me? Is that goodbye? Do you get hungry? What's your language? And so other, there's some sort of establishing a more personal relation to the object, switching the relation between the spot, respondent and the interviewer around as well. And then some sets engage uh, more specifically in computing, um, trying to accommodate the language of the reci recipient as with the printer. So, and I assume that these things, there are also um, audio recordings of animals and machine sounds that, that must exist as well. I, I couldn't find them there, but... Um, but then others were even stranger, oh, uh, there, which were sort of more 
rarely recognizable as questions of sort of more aesthetic or programmatic forms. Um, and so these are just some of the many sets I found in the archives of his old depart department. But we can only speculate how many may have been thrown out in the, in the thought that they were meaningless scribbles. And what about the results? Like Wheeler wrote very little about the discoveries he actually made in posing these questions um, and any answers he might have received. I, I, so I found no real accounts of the end results of all, all these hours of questioning. So I guess, I guess I'll end with a, a quote from that 1882, oh, that's wrong in here, uh, from that ah, 80, 1882 uh, book um, that I found in his labra library from the preface. It's always difficult to codify laws composed wholly on, of decisions. And remember, this is for the game, 20 questions. It's, I just found it strangely uh, applicable. It's always difficult to reduce to writing traditions wholly oral. But it becomes an almost impossible task to draw up a set of rules founded entirely on traditional decisions. Still, as his merit is great, who achieves a seemingly impossibility, and as the demand for some fixed form for his highly intellectual, for this highly intellectual game is urgent, this attempt has been made in the hope that the difficulties of the case may be considered in criticizing the shortcomings of the author. <laughs> New York, 1882. Uh, there. <laughs>